Good morning and welcome to Christ Community Church Live. No matter where or when you're watching or wherever I may be recording from, we are still just so excited to have you a part of our service today.
foundation, God. You truly are our solid rock. And I pray that we trust, church, that he is keeping us steady, that he is holding us up in and through all of our circumstances and situations. Trust your God. Praise him and worship him for he is worthy.
We rest in your presence, God. In the truth of who you are. That you protect us, God. That you draw near to us in our time of trouble. Father, you are so worthy of our praises. And we lift our voices and our hearts to you in worship and praise to the only King.
beginning and when all things pass away, you remain God. Your power remains, your spirit remains, Lord Jesus. And we praise you, Father, because you are true, because you are worthy, Lord Jesus. And because by your grace, you have made a way for us. So praise him, church. Come on, sing that again. Waymaker, believe it. Trust in him. Have faith in your God. Because he is with us. Before we continue with our time of service, I just wanted to share with you guys my four walls. This is the place that I sit every weekend and make sure that we have a video together for our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. But now, as we enter into September, we're going to move beyond our four walls and start our outdoor services. To speak more of that, I'm going to switch this over to Josh so he can tell you about the exciting things going on at Christ Community Church. Hey, good morning, Christ Community Church. Hope that you've had a great week and that your Sunday is off to a fantastic start. Uh, we've been busy this week getting settled in our new house, kind of keeping our distance. Uh, but so many of you guys have reached out, left off meals, and found other ways to reach out and to help us get settled in. And we are so grateful for the way that you guys have welcomed us. I personally am really excited to begin our outdoor worship gatherings together next Sunday, 10 a.m. Uh, Lord willing, we will be gathering to worship outside at our church property, 219 Berry Road. And we're going to be doing that every Sunday in September. I can't wait to actually be able to worship with you guys for the first time in person. And so I just want to share a few details about what that's going to look like for us. Uh, we're going to be gathering, as I said, on the lawn at our church property. So feel free to bring lawn chairs, blankets, uh, whatever you want to sit on. We will not have a separate square one class for kids, but we will have activity bags for them to do during the service as you worship together as a family. And I promise uh, I will do my best not to get too long-winded in my messages to make it easier for families, especially with young kids. Uh, we are going to be observing the social distancing guidelines that the state has laid out for us. So we ask that you would please wear a mask, that you would try to keep some distance between yourself, and especially as we're worshiping together, that we would keep some distance between family groups. Uh, we're not going to be coming around with a tape measure or anything like that. But thankfully, uh, God's blessed us with plenty of room at our property. We've got room to spread out. So let's try to do that as we worship together. And of course, if you're feeling sick, please stay home and worship with us online. Now, we know that some of you aren't going to be able to make it for various reasons, and so we will continue posting a service to Facebook Live every week at 10 a.m. It'll be the same sermon that I'm preaching in person, so there's going to be an option to worship online if you can't join us in person. 
Uh, that also means that if it's raining, we're going to be canceling our in-person gatherings and simply worshiping together online. You can watch our Facebook page for all of that cancellation information. If we do need to cancel an in-person gathering because of the weather, we're going to post that on our Facebook page no later than 9 a.m. So I really hope that you can join us next week. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email, joshs at christcommunityfredonia.com. Uh, but I can't wait to see you next week. Today, we're going to be continuing our series through the book of Philippians. Now, as a reminder, the book of Philippians is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church that he started in Philippi. And Paul is in prison when he writes this letter. And he writes to the Philippians to remind them of the hope that they have in the unstoppable gospel of Jesus, no matter what they're facing. And today, Paul shows us how we can have unstoppable joy. How the gospel creates in us the kind of joy that can't be derailed, that can't be crushed by any set of circumstances that we're walking through. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 26 today. So let's look at that. Philippians 1, starting at verse 12. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some, indeed, preach Christ from rivalry and envy, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Now here's what I love about the Bible. The Bible is a very real book. You can see it in this passage. The Bible is not some lofty, otherworldly religious book. The Bible was written by real people, to real people, suffering real hardships in the midst of real life. Friend, wherever you find yourself today, God's Word meets you there. If things are going well for you, God's Word meets you there. If things are going badly for you, God's Word meets you there. God's Word meets us in the valley, and God's Word meets us on the mountaintop. Wherever you are, God's word has the power to fill you with unstoppable joy in the midst of whatever it is that you're facing. Paul's writing this from prison, but the chains that bound Paul could not restrain his joy. Now let me ask you, don't you want that kind of joy? Don't you hunger for a joy that can't be stopped? So how do you get that kind of joy? How do you get the kind of joy that can endure prison and persecution and sickness and sorrow and everything that life and death can throw at you? Well, that's what we're going to see in this passage today. We're going to see three things that we need to do if we want that kind of joy. Three things for how to have unstoppable joy. And here they are. One, live for something bigger than yourself. Two, trust in someone bigger than yourself. And three, love someone who is better than anything else. Live for something bigger than yourself. Trust in someone bigger than yourself. And love someone who's better than anything else. First, live for something big, bigger than yourself. Verse 12. 
I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. See, Paul had experienced the gospel. His life had been turned upside down by Jesus, and now his life goal is to make it known. He lived for something bigger than himself. He lived for something bigger than his own freedom. He lived for something bigger than his own life. Paul lived to proclaim the gospel of Jesus that had turned his life upside down. And even from prison, he saw how God was using his imprisonment to advance the gospel. Listen, friends, if you want enduring joy, don't live for your own comfort. Don't live for yourself. Don't live for your own freedom. Don't even live for your own life. Live for something bigger than yourself. Paul says, what's happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. I've gained access to places I otherwise never would have gained access. I've had the chance to preach to people who otherwise never would have heard about Jesus. Those guards that were assigned to keep Paul in prison thought that they were restraining him. They thought that they were stopping him from preaching the gospel. But the gospel can't be restrained. The gospel can't be stopped. The gospel can't be chained up or imprisoned or quarantined for that matter. Those chains didn't stop the gospel. Those chains were God's way of unleashing the gospel. Paul looked at that prison guard, and in his mind, he said, you know, you think that you, that I'm stuck in here with you, but the truth is that you're stuck in here with me. You think I'm your captive, but the fact is that because of these chains, now I've got a captive audience to preach the gospel to. And Paul begins preaching the gospel to these imperial guards, and the gospel begins to spread like wildfire throughout their ranks. Paul lived for the advancement of the gospel, and the gospel is unstoppable, and that means that Paul's joy is unstoppable. Friends, if you want unstoppable joy, then you need an unstoppable gospel. Only an unstoppable gospel can give you unstoppable joy. The the word gospel literally means good news. And we all live for some kind of good news. We all build our lives on some message of hope. For some of us, it's the gospel of money. For some of us, it's the gospel of politics. For some of us, it's the gospel of family. For some of us, it's the gospel of sex and drugs and rock and roll. But we are all living for something that we think will make us happy. We are all trusting in some kind of good news. But the fact is, is that all of those other things will eventually disappoint you. Money will disappoint you. Politics will disappoint you. Family will disappoint you. Sex will disappoint you. None of those things can give you the kind of joy that endures when life falls apart. But Jesus can. The good news of Jesus is the one thing that can give you unstoppable joy in life and in death. Because the good news of Jesus tells us about a man who suffered and died in the most horrific way imaginable. And three days later, he came out of the grave and he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Death couldn't stop him. The grave couldn't hold him. Hell itself tried to hold him down, but he got up. And if you build your hope on him, he will carry you through with unstoppable joy. Paul finds himself in prison, but the very fact that he's in prison enables him to preach the gospel to people he otherwise would never have had access to. And not only is he able to preach the gospel to people he otherwise never would have been able to preach to, he is also able to encourage other believers that he otherwise never would have been able to encourage. Look at verse 14. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul says, word's gotten around to the other Christians here in Rome. They've heard that I'm in prison. They've heard what I'm going through. But that hasn't stopped them from preaching the gospel. In fact, that has motivated them to preach the gospel more boldly. Friends, there may be times in your life when you walk through something really difficult. And there might be a million things that God is doing in your life during those difficult times. But sometimes, sometimes it's not even about you. 
Sometimes God places you in difficult situations in your life to help other people through you. He wants to use our difficulty to strengthen the faith of others. I mean, think about it. When you see a brother or sister trusting in Christ in the midst of terrible circumstances, there is something about that that gives you confidence in the Lord. You start to realize that the gospel is not merely a matter of talk. The gospel is a life-changing power. This is one of the reasons I love reading Christian biographies. This is why I encourage you to read biographies of great Christians of the past. Because these people weren't perfect. They had faults and flaws and failures and sins. But when you see how God came through for them, when you see how they trusted him in life and in death, it helps to bolster your faith for whatever you're walking through. As Paul was trusting Jesus in prison, his brothers and sisters saw his example and they were set free to boldly preach the gospel of Christ. Paul's chains didn't stop the gospel. They unleashed the gospel. And here's what's so cool about Paul's passion for the gospel. Paul's passion for the gospel utterly set him free from his own ego. Look at verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ from rivalry and envy, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Paul says, some people are trying to make trouble for me. Some people out there around Rome think that if they preach the gospel, the authorities will take it out on me. They'll crack down on me. But that doesn't bother me because they are doing exactly what I hope they will do. They are preaching Christ. And to me, that is all that matters. Friends, do you see how the gospel sets you free from your own ego? Let me just confess something to you. As a pastor, one of my great temptations is to be jealous of other pastors. And if I'm not careful, I can constantly get into this internal competition with other pastors and other churches. I'm always comparing myself to them. How many people did they have on Sunday? How was their last sermon? Could I have preached it better? And sometimes there can even be this competition among churches where we start to question each other's motives. And the truth is, there are people who preach the gospel with bad motives. There are people, believe it or not, who use religion as a, as a means to selfish gain. But what we want is for Christ to be preached. And so if another church here in town is preaching the gospel of Christ, we celebrate that. Because it's not about us. It's about Jesus. See, when you are living for something bigger than yourself, when you are living for the advancement of the gospel, you are set free from those ego games that we so often play. So let me ask you today, what are you living for? What are you living for? Because if it's anything other than Jesus, if it's anything other than to know Christ and to make him known, then whatever it is will ultimately disappoint you. It will not sustain you through the hard times of life. But the chains that bound Paul could not restrain his joy. How do we find that kind of joy? The first way is to live for something bigger than yourself. The second thing is to trust in someone bigger than yourself. Trust in someone bigger than yourself. Verse 19 I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul says, whether I live or die, I know that I can trust Jesus. Whether I live or die, Jesus will deliver me. Now, my deliverance might come through life or it might come through death, but Jesus will deliver me. See, Paul's ultimate prayer was not to get out of prison. His ultimate prayer was that Christ would be honored either by his life or by his death. 
What a great place to be. What a freeing place to be. Whatever happens to you, whether you live or die, you know that Jesus has your best interests at heart, and so you can trust him no matter what. So you pour out your heart to him. You pray and you make your requests to him. You ask him to deliver you. But at the end of the day, you trust that he knows more than you know. And he loves you even better than you love yourself. And you can trust whatever he decides. The fact is that if we're following Jesus, hard times will come our way. That's simply part of following Jesus. And to be honest, that's simply part of life in a fallen, broken down, messed up world. But here's where the gospel changes the game. The gospel reminds us that God is not distant from our suffering. The gospel reminds us that Jesus willingly suffered with us and suffered for us. And the gospel reminds us that suffering is not the last word. The gospel reminds us that resurrection is the last word. And just as God was doing something better through the suffering of Jesus, he promises to do something better through your suffering. The gospel reminds us that nothing is wasted. Hard times are part of life, but you you are trusting in Jesus. Those hard times are never wasted. He will take the ugliest thing that you have ever experienced and he will turn it into something more beautiful than you could ever possibly imagine. That's how you find unstoppable joy. Live for something bigger than yourself. Trust in someone bigger than yourself. Finally, love someone who's better than anything else. Love someone who is better than anything else. Verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul says Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. Whatever it costs me, Jesus is worth it. Whatever I have to endure, Jesus is worth it. Whatever I have to give up, Jesus is worth it. Because Jesus is better than anything else. This is not just about trusting some higher power. This is not just about giving your life to some great cause. This is about knowing a person. This is about knowing Jesus. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Because Jesus is better than anything else in this world. I mean, think about what Paul lost here. He lost his freedom, but Jesus is better than freedom. He lost his reputation, but Jesus is better than reputation. He would eventually lose his life, but Jesus is better than life. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Now, let me ask you, can you say that? Can you say that from the depths of your being? Can you say, Jesus is better than my reputation? Can you say, Jesus is better than my freedom? Can you say, Jesus is better than my comfort? Can you say, Jesus is better than life itself? Can you say, to live is Christ and to die is gain? Friends, that is the only way you will experience unstoppable joy. So what does that look like? How do we actually live that out? See, see, I think for many of us, we get the second part of that verse. The second part of that verse says, to die is gain. And we kind of get that. We get that. We, We get to go see Jesus when we die. But what about the first part? What does it really mean to live as Christ? What does that practically look like in day to day life? Because the fact is that there may come a day when we are called to decide whether we will die for Christ. And I certainly want to be ready for that day. But that's not where we are right now. So, what does it look like for us to live for Christ? What does it look like for our lives to say to live is Christ in this time and in this place? Well, Paul shows us what that looks like. Look at verse 22. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. 
Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Paul says, I might live or I might die, and if I'm honest, I don't even know which to choose. I mean, I love you guys, but I would much rather be with Jesus. And at the same time, I think Jesus wants me to stick around so that I can continue serving you. He says, if I'm just thinking about myself, I'd rather go to be with Jesus. But it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And it's about you. It's about you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. So I'm going to keep serving him and I'm going to keep serving you with every breath he gives me. Friends, that's why you and I are still here. That is why God continues to give us breath. Not so that we can live for ourselves and and only look out for ourselves, so that we can serve other people, so that we can point other people to Jesus, so that they also can experience the unstoppable joy that only Jesus can give. If you're young, this is why you're still here. If you're middle-aged, this is why you're here. If you are older, this is why you are here. If you woke up this morning, if your lungs inflated with oxygen, if your heart continues to beat, this is why we are still here. Not for ourselves, so that we can serve others, so that we can live for the good of others, so that we can point others to Jesus. Paul says, I don't know how many more breaths he'll give me, but I'm not going to waste a single one of them on myself. I'm going to pour out my life for Jesus, and I'm going to pour out my life for you. I don't know how much longer I've got, but one thing I know, one thing I can take to the bank, my only comfort in life and death is that whether I live or die, I get Jesus. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, can you say that today? Can you say, no matter what, whether I live or die, I've got unstoppable joy because I've got Jesus. And I'm not just asking, can you say that with your lips? Do you say that with your life? Do I say that with my life? Because if I'm honest, my life doesn't always say to live as Christ. If I'm honest, my life doesn't always say that Jesus is my life. And I was hit so hard with that this past week as I was preparing this message. We were in the middle of moving into our new house, and there's all these frustrations and setbacks and, frankly, expenses. And for a while, I allowed it to steal my joy. I mean, here I am with a house that the Lord has provided for me with an amazing wife and three great kids, with people reaching out to me and and doing all these things to help us get settled, about to start a new ministry with a fantastic church, with an opportunity to preach the gospel in the place that I grew up. I'm not in prison. I haven't been arrested or beaten for preaching the gospel. I'm not asking whether I'm going to die tomorrow. I've got it really good. But I forget so easily. I forget that Jesus is my life. In that moment, my heart said, to live is comfort. To live is convenience, not to live is Christ. And I don't want to live that way. I don't want to live with a fleeting joy that's dependent on circumstances. I don't want to live with a kind of joy that can be taken away when things don't go my way. I want the kind of unstoppable joy that only comes when Jesus is my life. But here's the beauty of the gospel. Here's the hope of the gospel for people like me. The gospel is not about us. The gospel is not about how we nail it. The gospel, friends, is not about how committed you are to Jesus. The gospel is about how committed Jesus is to you. The gospel is not about looking to yourself. The gospel, the writer of Hebrews tells us, is about looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. 
Jesus died and rose again to make us right with God, and he promises to complete the good work that he began in us. And so maybe you're like me today. Maybe sometimes your life doesn't always say to live as Christ. The good news is that Jesus isn't giving up on you, and he's not giving up on me. He invites us to come to him, to confess to him, to be honest with him about that. God, I have loved other things in your place. God, I have lived as if money is my life. I have lived as if my family is my life. I have lived as if my own comfort and convenience is my life. I have lived as if sin is my life. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. Please forgive me. Please cleanse me. Please help me to find my joy and my life in you. Please give me the kind of unstoppable joy that can only come when Jesus is my life. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for myself. That's my prayer for the people of Chautauqua County and Western New York that we would be filled with the kind of unstoppable joy that is only possible when Christ is our life. Let's pray. Father, so often we find our joy in other things. So often our joy is weak and it's fleeting, and it's because we haven't sunk our roots deep into you. We haven't come to the fountain of living waters to drink deeply and to have our souls satisfied. We, we haven't lived as if Christ is our life. Even if we say that with our lips, so often our hearts and our lives are far from you. And so I pray that, that you would fill us with the kind of unstoppable joy that only happens when Christ is our life. I pray that for my brothers and sisters at Christ Community Church. I pray that for others who might be listening to this today. I pray that for people all over Chautauqua County and all over Western New York, that, that you would fill us with the kind of joy that's only possible when we can honestly say to live as Christ and to die as gain. Thank you, Jesus, that you went to the cross because of the joy set before you that you endured the cross, despising the shame, that you will finish the work that you began in us. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Hey guys, thanks so much for worshiping with us this morning. I absolutely cannot wait to see you guys next Sunday, 10 a.m. in person. Uh, until then, peace be with you and have a great week. Thank you for being a part of our service today. For updates on information or a chance for online giving, you can visit our website at ChristCommunityFredonia.com. Also, stay tuned to our Facebook page to find out all the exciting details about our outdoor services starting next week, 10 a.m. at 219 Berry Road. We're excited to see you again. Thank you and have a great week.